This video contains content sponsored by John Wilson Blades and MK Blades. Opinions discussed in this video do not reflect the views of John Wilson or MK. Hello and welcome to The Skating Lesson. I'm Dave Lees and I'm thrilled to welcome John Coughlin. John, you're quite, you're quite busy. You're commentating, you're working for John Wilson and MK. You're still performing in shows. So where are you today? What are you doing? Well, I'm in Kansas City right now. I'm getting ready to head over to the, the World Championships um, in Helsinki, Finland. But uh, as you said, I'm just, I'm, I've been on the run quite a bit lately. Okay. So I want to talk about the World Championships with you. A lot of interesting matchups coming up. There's a, interesting discussions happening. And I think what's really interesting is that in the pair event, your discipline, we don't really know how the top teams are going to face up against because they haven't competed. We haven't seen Sui and Han compete against Tarasov and Morozov. Where do, do Hamill and Radford stack up against the best? Alexa and Chris are now returning to competition. What do you make of the field and what are you looking for? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a shootout for sure. When you look at how strong everyone performed at the, at the top at four continents and, and conversely over in Europeans, there was a really strong showing there as well. Um, it's hard, as you said, to slot teams in. I have a feeling based on the performances that I saw at Four Continents that the European scores will be will come back down to earth a little bit once mm -hmm. they're reconciled next to the Sui and Hans and Duhamel and Radfords of the world. Um, so I don't necessarily think you can compare those those two semifinals, if you will, apples to apples and say you can just just blend them in together. Mm -hmm. What do you look for? I mean, Sui and Han, I didn't, haven't seen them in person. What stood out to you about them when you watched them? It's just a, it's a, a charisma mm -hmm. and a, a command of the performance that I think stands out amongst a very talented field. There, there, are, some, there are some teams out there that have incredible components. Um, Savchenko Masso and their skating skills and transitions are absolutely stunning. But there's something about the way Sui and Han connect with the audience and connect with each other that just leaves them in a, I mean, it's a, it's a true performance. And that just, it wows me every time I see them. Okay, so I heard that Mr. Peterson brought you in as a twist doctor. So let's talk about twist. What do you look for? And talk a little bit about the levels of differentiating a twist. What is going to make a really good twist at the World Championships? Well, I mean, what I learned... Uh, about twist I learned from Delilah Sappenfield so credit where credit's due um, and you know that's still well on display with uh, Semeca and Kinyarim or Kinyarim and Kinyarim I should say um, so you know what what we always look for in a in a twist is um, the the peak before it starts coming over into rotation if if a, if a girl is gone you know before the the guy is fully extended then it, it kind of inhibits his ability to give his full power, and so pre-rotation from a girl is, is something that it's it's not a it's not a, a mastermind secret. That's one of the first things you look at. Whose twist do you like? Um, I mean, you, I gotta I gotta give props to Alexa and Chris because mm -hmm. they were doing doing quad twist, and their triple still looks very quad ready. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm gonna put them out there as my my number one uh, close. I, I would say a tie per second has to be Savchenko Masso and um, and our, our boy Big China. Um, <laughs> you, ha you have to give respect to him. That's also just a massive twist. And um, you know, I think Savchenko Masso. I'm just kind of waiting for them to do the quad because it seems overdue and like it would be pretty easy for them. But you know, as you you have to give respect to to the growing pains that it takes to put out an element like that. I, I think they could do it out of the gate, but then being able to put a program after it is a different story. How Do you think it should be worth more points than it is? You know, there's a debate, you know, are these quads worth enough based on how much they take out of you? So, um, I don't think that the quad twist is valued enough. Um, when you look at, at the point difference between a, a quad twist and a triple twist done at, say, a level four, and then you look at a triple toe and a quad toe, the the disparity there is, is not at all similar, and it should be. I think the, the twist is one of the most dangerous elements in all of pair skating, and I think that they're, they should be more rewarded for executing it well. So you said that the twist is one of the most dangerous elements. Now, 
I would think that most things in pair skating are pretty dangerous. So what about it in the training makes it particularly dangerous? Um, because there isn't really a, a safety net situation for it, right? Even with the, the throw quads, we've seen video of people practicing those in that fishing pole harness. Mm -hmm. For quad twists, you practice making your triple as big as you can and having pristine technique, and then you just have to go try it at some point. And you can't really skate into it slowly because momentum is part of the process. So it's just so dangerous. It's so explosive. The girl has to rotate so fast and break out at the last second. And this is all happening while the both of them are flying down the ice and the man is stepping from backwards to forwards while generating all of that power. It's just a, it's honestly, it's a recipe for disaster. So the, you know, the Kinerums, the, mm -hmm. Um, the other teams in the world that do that, they, they deserve the credit that they're not, in my opinion, getting full uh, advantage of. Hold on one second. Your camera just went off mid. Now you're back. That's weird. Ah. Okay. I guess let me just try to redo that answer. Let me just try to go from there. I don't know what happened. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the thing about the quad twist is that there isn't really any safety net situation. There aren't really any training wheels, you know, whereas you've, you've seen with um, people that are, are broaching quad throws, doing that with the fishing pole harness. And that's not to say that that's not to discredit what the, the skaters are doing that are doing throw quads. I just think, you know, you make your triple twist as big as you can. And then at some point you just have to go for it and you can't skate into it slowly or, or baby your way through it. It's all out because momentum down the ice is, part of the, the equation and the girl has to go up so high, rotate so fast, break out at the last second. So the guy has a very short window to be able to spot her hips and catch them. And oh, by the way, while he's generating all this force, he's trying to step from backwards to forwards. So there's just a, a lot going on. It's a recipe for disaster. So teams like the Kinerums that, that have done the, the quad twist, I think they need to be re rewarded more for it. Now, when you're awarding GOE for the lifts, I want to ask you, how much should the, how far the lift travels? Because when you watch different teams, different teams take the lifts full lengths of the ice versus half lengths of the ice, how should that be evaluated? Um, you know, again, I, I, what I like is the way that I was coached and mm -hmm. um, Delilah's big on ice coverage. And I have to agree with her. If you see a lift going up before the blue line and you have to bend around the end of the rink because you're out of real estate, to me, that shows command. I think, when I'm awarding GOEs for a for a pair lift, I'm looking for, I call them boring lift turns from the guys because he's so steady on his feet, you don't even notice that he's turning. So that translates up to secure positions. And then you're looking for dynamic positions and position changes from the girl. And that exclamation point is that unexpected exit. Um, so those are the components that really speak to me when I'm looking at a lift. Now you said boring turns for the guy. Now the lift, when the guy goes on one foot, and we see a little bit of the wobble. How is that evaluated? How should you evaluate it? And does it make you nervous to watch? Um, you know, I think each judge will probably weigh that differently. For mm -hmm. me, if, I'm, if I kind of grip the, the edge of my seat when someone goes up or takes a step, I have a hard time saying that that lift should be in the pluses mm -hmm. because as scary as pairs is, mm -hmm. you should be able to be at ease watching it, especially at a world level. Okay. Now you're going to be there for the men's competition. We talked about not seeing the pairs, you know, stack up against each other. Now we have seen all of the top men and we've seen what they're capable of. And it seems like the men keep one upping one another. Shoma Uno just went out and almost set a record score at a, at a small competition. Who do you like? Who, you know, who has the momentum going into the world championships? You know, the, the difference between pairs and singles between four continents and Europeans is that the, the heavy hitters are primarily on the, the four continent side. You have to slot Javier in there, in, and he's owed that respect from being world champion. But outside of him, I don't see anyone from the European side that is really challenging what we mm -hmm. saw at four continents. Um, I, I think Shoma could end up on the podium. I really mm -hmm. do. I think he's a, he's a momentum skater, and he seems really hot right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I have him as someone that I think will land, maybe probably on that third spot, if, he, if you know, things go as they, as, they, mm -hmm. as they should. But you know, with that many quads right now, we're seeing 
a huge jump in the number of quads, but there's still a lot of room for error. They're still very risky, and especially under the brightest of lights, we have to remember that Yuzuru, as incredible as he is, had a less than stellar skate at Worlds last year, so um, anything can happen. What's your take on Yuzuru? Because we haven't seen him as good as he was at the Grand Prix Final last season. Do you think he's trying to peak for the World Championships and build perhaps more steadily through the season, or is he, you know, just not having his best year? I mean, well, you you have to remember that that he is pushing the envelope. Mm -hmm. So if you look at if you look at Javier, for instance, he hasn't opted to add in another quad, mm -hmm. and. Yuzuru said, I'm going to go through the, the growing pains this year. I'm going to add the loop. I think it became such a focal point. And you watch these skaters. You heard Patrick mention it in Kiss and Cry at one point this year to Marina. He said, I, it's been so much the sow, the sow, the sow that it ended up affecting my toe. Mm -hmm. He said that at one of the events. And, and you have to think that uh, to some degree, Yuzuru had that same experience, whereas he was improving the quad loop. Some of the other things suffered. But um, the one thing that I'll say was was – pleasing to see about Yuzuru is that he's skating a little less emotional, and I mean that in a good way. He seems a little bit more methodical in what he's doing, and if he has an error, it doesn't derail the program, because for a while there, I felt like when he took the ice, we were either going to see one of the best performances we've ever witnessed, or kind of one of those meltdowns where he kind of lets his head hang and swings his arms as he's skating down the ice, and now I never feel like he's checked out. He's fighting all the way through. Yeah, I think Worlds was pretty shocking because if you saw him in the short program, he was a different skater than the free skate last year. That's Yeah, that's a good point. What do you make of Nathan Chen? Obviously, he has all the buzz going into the World Championships. There have been so many debates about components, amongst the men and transitions. Nathan Chen, he's riding a wave here. Do you think, I mean, do you think he could win the World Championships? I think he absolutely could win the world championships. I think the case can be made that he's the favorite to win the world championships. Mm -hmm. um, and that in itself is a storyline to me to watch. You know, now it's real for Yuzuru mm -hmm. that there's someone out there that on their best day can beat me. And even when I skate reasonably well, um, now Yuzuru has components to fall back on that I think are superior at this time to Nathan's. That's not to say that I don't think Nathan can grow into those. I think his components have improved throughout the season. I think early on he made no bones about the fact that he was trying to get comfortable with that quad content and as the season's gone on he's looked more committed to his choreography and and exuding more personality throughout. Um, but yeah, I, th I think with what he's done to to be able to, to win in that four continents field, you have to give him that respect of being the favorite. What do you make of Patrick Chan? Because he's a bit of a sleeper, I think. Could he, if he does his best and there are mistakes, you know, where do you where do you put him? I mean, you have to remember that that Javi won a world title with what is similar content to what Patrick is doing this year. I mean, the, he's not he's not doing two quads in the short program. I know, but if he skates as cleanly as he can in the short, I think he'll be within striking distance of the podium should he skate clean. Um, I think he needs to add. I think he needs to add a quad in the short. I think he needs to go sow and toe next year. I don't think he should do it here because I think it could just end up being a bad experience for him. But when he skates as clean as he can, it access it. It allows him to access those those components, which in my opinion are the best in the world. And I think he will be rewarded well. He's one of those people though that um, because he's not doing an array of quad jumps needs the GOEs, right? Mm -hmm. So he can't let the, the, the kryptonite for Patrick could very well be, is he going to skate cleanly through the, the LUT sequence that we mm -hmm. saw him have trouble with? Or those, those random little things that he normally is used to getting the, the Patrick Chan deserved pluses on, if he lets those go, he's out of the conversation. But I think if he skates two clean programs, he can be there when it's all said and done. You speak of GOE. With a clean program, where can Jason Brown finish? Because he's not playing the quad game that we know of he said that he may put the quads in if he's feeling good where do where can he finish because last year at the world championships there were a lot of mistakes and people there was a lot of shifting that happened between the short and the free skate so what do you make of jason i think you know similarly to what i said for patrick obviously to a greater degree because he's not including the quad he needs to be all about goes i think when his goes are there 
It allows people to be entranced by his performance, and that in turn boosts his components, as it should. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people make the argument that components and technicals shouldn't be tied together, but if you're falling all over the ice, of course it affects your components. And mm -hmm. and he has some beautiful programs this year, Jason. And when he skates them cleanly, those components should be up towards the best in the world. I don't care what anybody says. Like, they're, he's a stunning skater. He does he does well his with his strengths as much as anybody else does with their strengths in the world. So I think he could definitely finish in the top 10, potentially the top eight, if he skates as cleanly as he can. And I think that would, if we look at the season that he's been through to this point, if he can go out and put two programs together that land him in that range, I think we would say mission accomplished. Good job, Jason. Mm -hmm. Now, how about dance? It looks like it's going to be the showdown of some Titan teams, you know, even within the same rink. Do you expect it to be a battle between the Canadians and the French for that top spot? Oof. Um, you know, the, the Canadians, the Virtue and More have been so strong this season. I feel like they've almost distanced themselves um, to where they're, they're the, the clear favorite and that uh, Papadakis and Cizeron are, are, ch are chasing. Mm -hmm. And um, I've always been a Tessa and Scott fan, and I was excited that they were coming back. But I was so mesmerized by the French last year that it was hard to picture a world where anyone could touch them. Um, so it's been, uh, shocking to, to see Tessa and Scott reinvent themselves yet again. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think that, you know, the, the ships have, they seem to just grow throughout the season. That's just, that's just their, their thing, right? They, they start out and everyone's like, well, they're, you know, hopefully they grow into that program and they train it until it's stronger and, um, they just have this slow and steady thing about them where, and you see it happening in the scoring throughout the year. And I think that they will be close, closer to Papadakis and Cizeron than we would have ever thought. I don't know if they'll overtake them, but I expect them to give them a run for their money. They certainly have an advantage in the short dance too, where the French typically have problems with the constraints of the patterns. And that's, the ships don't have that. How, well, well, it's, it's the, it's the, it's the constraints for the French, but it's also the homework that the Shibs did, right? Yeah. Because, I mean, they, they found, I mean, that, that program's a home run in the short dance. So oh, for sure. I think, it, I think it's both of both sides there. Yeah, I mean, they've always had the really strong patterns and that really strong foundation to their skating. And the French, it's more, you're trying to put very creative skating in a box and it doesn't always look like it fits. So that'll be right. interesting to see. What do you make of the other American teams? There's, you know, a lot of jockeying for positions as the Olympics grow closer and in the dance world. Who do you think has the momentum right now? Um, in dance? Yeah. Um, you know, you look at, at, at Chalk and Bates and they, you know, re-choreograph certain parts of their program, which is also something that, that they're known to do. It, it doesn't mm -hmm. seem like the initial choreography is ever um, the finished product. And I... You know, there. I used to say that I didn't like that, but if you outgrow something, and why then why not challenge yourself even further? And I think if if they get to a point where they're like, you know what, we're ready to take on more within this character, more within this rhythm, then 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 God bless them, go do it. And it and it seems to work for them. And maybe that's what keeps it fresh for them and keeps them charging. And they're another team um, along with the ships that I think. You know, seemed to, to peak at the right time. You could say that very much about last year for them. Their their finish at the World Championships was a was a, a peak for them for the season, and and I anticipate that they'll be ready to do something similar. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about the ladies because I think the odds on favorite for the gold would have to be Evgenia Medvedeva. Although Europeans happened almost two months ago, so we haven't seen everyone at their you know to see where they are. Right. It's um. It's, it's just so hard to bet against uh, Yevgenia because mm -hmm. she's just such a machine. Um, you know, I just watched the, the World Junior Championships and saw who's waiting in the wings for Russia, and, mm -hmm. and that's pretty impressive as well. But um, I just, I don't really see, I, I, it's going to be hard for someone to knock her off. You almost feel like there would need to be errors from her, and that's just hard to fathom at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, what do you think? 
I think it has n- not even her skating. I think that Evgenia's mind is so impressive that when she's had errors this year, even if she misses an opening combination, she's able to tack on the jump later and it doesn't phase her. Right. And last year she was behind after the short and it just shows that she's able to go out there and make the adjustments that I think it's going to be very difficult for her to lose the world championships because she's capable of regrouping on a dime like that. So I think that that gives her the biggest advantage beneath her. I really think it's actually quite wide open. I know a lot of people expect Pogorlai to be second and I think that she has that ability, but you have so many names. Obviously, Satoko Miyahara is out. Who else do you like for, you know, the top four, the top five? I think that there will be two Americans in the top four. Um, okay. And potentially potentially two Amer- North Americans um, on the podium. Okay. I think that, I think that the way Osmond's been skating mm-hmm. um, over this season as a whole, I just, I feel like Canada is poised to have a world medalist. There's just, mm-hmm. you know, there's so much depth in their in their top three or four it's just and they're so battle tested every time they go out because of that i just had this feeling that that there'll be a canadian on the on the podium and um you know i think that ashley and until she proves otherwise is is still a fierce competitor and i think she got that taste of what she's always wanted uh last season and i cannot see her letting that go without a fight Mm-hmm. Um, it was interesting. I, I saw her post something saying that, that they re part of her short program to make it less of a show program. Mm-hmm. Um, and because, you know, it, it had that, I just stepped out of a dance club vibe to it mm-hmm. and it was very fun and engaging, but you want to be bulletproof when it comes to the judges panel. And one could point to certain sections and say, you know, it's a little glidey on two feet here, mm-hmm. even though maybe it was being completely effective to the music. So if she's grown that program to where it's beyond reproach, reproach, she could um, definitely position herself to make a run at yet another medal in the free program. I, I definitely agree. I think it was interesting at the Nationals, she really fought in that free skate and willed herself you know, to give a clean performance there. And I think that that speaks a lot to what will happen at the World Championships. Do you think it's an advantage for Ashley that she hasn't competed as many times because we haven't had a chance to dissect her programs as many times. I mean, she talked about the transitions, but the judges, you know, they didn't see her at the Grand Prix final or for continents. They haven't seen a lot of Ashley Wagner. Could that be a benefit? You know, they. I think when she shows up and she's really trained, that's the key for her. I think mm-hmm. the the main focal point is that when she steps on the ice, she can look back and say, mm-hmm. "There was nothing more I could have done to prepare for this moment," mm-hmm. and that comes at home through the training that she and Roth do. And I think that when she gets the world championships, the way she's been, I mean, we all follow all these athletes on social Mm -hmm. media, everything that she's been posting has been about, you know, in the gym with Mm -hmm. Mariah Bell, or, you know, here's another spin, um, a beautiful spin combination that she did the other day. Like everything that she's even posting in her personal life seems to be focused towards her end goal and training. So I'm confident that we're going to see a very well prepared Ashley Wagner. She seemed very confident on her conference call. And another thing that she said was that she wasn't worried about the three spots. She said she's been on teams that have won it, lost it, every you know, situation. You're from the pairs where the U.S. You know, has had two spots for the last decade or so. What do you make of the fixation on whether there are two spots, three spots? I mean, is that a trap to even get into when you're going into the World Championships? You know, I think we have to give a lot of credit to that generation of girls, the Ashley Gracie, mm-hmm. um, that, that went and got those three spots back for us. And, mm-hmm. you know, now they're confident and sitting atop the world and I can see where it wouldn't be as stressful for Ashley now, but when you're going after three spots, you're trying to, you're trying to look out for yourself in a way, especially mm-hmm. heading into an Olympic year. Um, you want to have as, as much opportunity for yourself for the following season. So it's not like a mid free program at, the world championships, you're not thinking, oh my God, oh my God, three spots, three spots, is this going to be enough? But I think you're cognizant of the fact and you feel a sense of responsibility for yourself as well as your teammates to go out and get the job done so that Team USA has as many berths as possible. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned two ladies in the top four from the U.S. 
who are you thinking? Ashley? And who else is your money on? Oh, I said two skaters from North America. Oh, North America. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. I, I, in the top four, I, I would I would think okay. that we'll have a Canadian and American in there. Okay. Um, but, you know, it, it's – Mariah Bell has a little bit more of an international resume, in my mm -hmm. opinion, and, and I don't think this will be as – eye-opening to her as maybe for for Karen but um, you know watching Karen skate at the US Championships if that Karen shows up at Worlds I may have just put my foot in my mouth you know what mm -hmm. I mean so it's all in it's all in which Karen shows up um, and she's I mean she's open about saying that that nerves are a big thing for her and mm -hmm. um, I think that this is a wonderful opportunity for her to to learn to harness that yeah I think with Karen that I personally have no expectations on what I would expect Karen to place. I think that if she skates well, she's capable of finishing very, very high. And I think that, um, you know, her results will show that. Uh, it's interesting with Mariah. If she's had a down competition over the last two years, the next one is typically good. So Nationals was a higher one. Four continents, not her best. I'm expecting Mariah Bell to skate pretty well at the World Championships. I also think she's in a rink where everyone's getting ready for Worlds. There's a lot of momentum there, and I think that that's when you have that tight knit group. I think that she's definitely at an advantage. I, uh, you just took the words out of my mouth. I think the best thing for her right now is that she's training along someone who's been there, done that, mm -hmm. and is a pro at preparation. Um, so it was it was very impressive to me to see them posting, uh, you know, photos and videos training together. Um, I'm excited for. U.S. ladies that, you know, Ashley has chosen that role of, you know, let's go do this together. Um, I think that's a, a, a very mature way to, to tackle things and, and the sign of a, a good leader within that camp. Now, let's discuss you coming up and what you're up to at the World Championships, because which hat are you wearing uh, there <laughs> at the Worlds? Are you there as a commentator? Are you there for HD Sports? What are you? I, I won't be there as a commentator. I'll be there... Um, I was my name was put up by U.S. Figure Skating as mm -hmm. to be considered for one of the athlete ambassador commissions um, that the that ISU has um, brought about at, since the last ISU Congress. So um, I'll be there to be around in case anybody has any questions about that. Um, but to to do that would be something more behind the scenes that um, you know I. The way I would approach it would be to just reach out to athletes and see what it is that they're experiencing on the field of play, what they would look for um, from their sport when it comes to, to growth after this next Olympic Games. I think we could see some, some exciting changes. I think that time is coming, and um, I want athletes to have a seat at the table for that conversation. So um, if, if I have a chance to do that, that's great. Um, one of the other exciting things for me is that I've started, I've, I'm starting to take a, a, a full-time position with – um, MK and John Wilson, um, as well as, as helping with uh, Resport and promoting the, the brands in North America um, through a company, Aero, uh, which is the, the North American distributor for um, MK and John Wilson, or the U.S. distributor, I'm sorry, for MK and John Wilson. So now what do you do you know, through your promotions? Are you, what kind of things are you engaged with? Um, well, one of the big things that I do is I, I try to be the – the conduit between the company and the athlete. Um, if it's related to, you know, boot prototypes or blade prototypes or um, making sure that elite athletes have the equipment that they need, um, getting to key events and kind of talent IDing the, the, you know, Ashley Wagners and Nathan Chen's of the future and making sure that we're getting them the support they need maybe before they're even on U.S. figure skating's radar. Um, so it's really, it's been an incredible role for me because it was something that was organic and I was passionate about helping these athletes and, um, it's given me an opportunity to see the industry side of the sport. And, you know, I never foresaw myself getting involved in the, the quote unquote industry side of anything because I was always just so passionate about the sport itself, but realizing and, and being lucky enough to be linked up with a company that seems so genuinely concerned with the the future of the sport and the athletes that wear their equipment. It just, it felt right. So to transition into this more full-time role is an exciting thing for me. It'll bring me some great stability. Now, how did you transition? Because you obviously were competing through 2014. Katie's ankle was injured. We have seen you do shows. So how did you go about making, 
you know, that transition? You know, it was something that just kind of took on a life of its own. I think it's so hard to find a road after you're done competing, especially if it happens abruptly. Um, and so I was just kind of saying, yes, I'll try to everything that, that came my way and trying to figure out where my little place in the world was. Um, so I, I ran into Tom Cantwell, uh, uh, the CEO of um, HD's, of MK and John Wilson, the factory over there in, in Sheffield, England. And, um, you know, he at the time was in a position similar to what I'll be doing in the U.S. and just was a passionate guy and, and seemed committed to um, leaving his legacy on the brand and leaving it better than he found it. And that was inspiring to be around. So I just jumped at the opportunity to work with him and the rest of it kind of just, just came naturally. So how did you get into commentary? Do you have to send an audition tape? Do you practice commentating uh, when you're watching skating videos? I mean, how does that come about? Um, you know, coming up in skating and working at the Olympic Training Center, I always kind of jumped at the opportunity to, uh, to be in that athlete spokesperson role because I thought it was good practice for me if I ever had an opportunity to do something like that. Um, you know, knowing Scott Hamilton growing up, it was – it was someone that was an idol in every way, and that was something that I always enjoyed, his enthusiasm and commentary, and um, it was just something that was always in the back of my mind, I guess. Uh, you know, I, I owe a lot to the pros, like, uh, you know, Tanith and, and how she anchors the desk literally um, and figuratively, just, just, just holds us all together um, with, with her charisma and grace and her knowledge of the sport and her knowledge of the nuance of, of broadcasting. Um, so I really just sat next to her and, and took notes and, um, you know, did my best to, to soak up what she had to offer. The ice network, uh, team is very supportive and I think they recognize that they're approving grounds for, uh, bigger and better things. And they take pride in, in people that have worked with them being, promoted up, um, to, to work with networks. And so it's been an honor. Um, you know, we'll see how much of that I do if I'm, um, you know, if I'm happen to be elected to this ISU position because, um, you know, there are only so many hours in the day and I, and I would want to give due attention to that as well as to, you know, my, my full-time position with, um, with Arrow here in the state. So, so how full-time would the ISU position be? Uh, you know, what does it really entail? It's it's not a it's not a full time position, mm -hmm. but you you want to be available to that. You know, as I understand it, you know my my role would be to be the the voice of the athletes, and to me to serve that well, I would be you know at the the beck and call of the committee when it comes to questions uh, related to the field of play, helping to write some of the rules, and um, I would be spending some time you know sending out questionnaires to the athletes and their coaches and trying to get the, the real pulse of what they're experiencing so that, you know, I, I'm becoming a true voice of the athlete. So, you know, behind the scenes, we're doing the work so that the, the athletes can be the focal point that they deserve to be. Mm -hmm. So I know that you'd have to be at many events, and one of the events coming up is going to be the World Synchro Championships. I know that there is supposed to be a premiere of a new blade there. Tell me about this. What have you been working on? Um, it's been a... It, it was a, an idea that hatched, you know, I mentioned earlier that I, I, meant, I met Tom Cantwell. Um, I met him at U.S. Synchronized Championships in 2014 when they were in the Springs. And um, one of the first questions he challenged me with is, you know, where's the white space? What are we missing? Mm -hmm. And I said, I think we're standing in it. You know, there are, there are a thousand athletes here that are, are skating on blades that weren't necessarily made for exactly what it is that they do. Um, and they're really hybrid skaters when you think about it. They're skating close in holds on, with people on either side of them and in front and in back. So they need, you know, some features of a, of a dance blade that allow accurate foot placement. But the sport's becoming more and more um, athletic and they're starting to jump and do side by side spins. And they're, they've been lifting for years now. So they need some, some freestyle aspects as well. Um, so they kind of allowed me this latitude to go out and, and partner with um, the Hayden Nets to go uh, create a blade that was finally designed specifically for the synchronized athlete. And it's gone through a couple different versions, but we're, uh, everyone's very excited with, with what we've settled on. 
and uh, we're ready to launch it. So what is the blade feature? You know, what makes it really good? If I'm a synchro skater, why do I want this blade? It has a, it has a more freestyle inspired toe pick, uh, okay. first of all, so that, you know, when you're, when you're lifting and jumping and spinning, you have that, that contact of that drag pick there that is, that is absolutely necessary. So it has, freestyle aspects in the toe pick, but a more dance, dance-esque heel length so that when you're making foot placement that's really close in your own turns or skating in close proximity to someone else, you don't have that extra blade out there that can be tripped over. And we all know that that can be uh, very perilous in the world of, of synchronized skating. Um, and additionally, there's a little more uh, stanchion height so that they can get to a deeper edge before slipping onto that boot. You know, that awful feeling when you're, when you're crossing under and you're trying to get that extra extension, which is so important when you're going after those skating skills and synchronized skating, you want to be able to be truly on that, that blade edge and not slipping onto the boot. So we address that and we swept the stanchions in such a way that it kind of accept, accentuates a toy, uh, the, we got to start this over. <laughs> okay. Man. <laughs> I was really rolling there. You were. This, <laughs> the stanchion was accentuating, yeah. Accentuated. Yeah. All right, so just ask me what the features are. Okay, so what are the features of this blade? If I am a synchro skater, why do I want to be on this blade in particular? Well, it has the features of different kinds of blades to really make that hybrid for the unique athlete that is a synchronized athlete. Um, the, the toe pick is more freestyle inspired, so there's a more aggressive drag pick. For when you're, you know, jumping and you know entering into those spins, and you're gliding backwards up there in a group lift, um, and doing different things like, you know, uh, some of these girls are doing death spirals now, and you need a more freestyle inspired pick. So we address that. We have a hybrid between a freestyle and a dance heel length because you need to, you can't have a, a heel that's so short that you can't rock back and feel like there's nothing there to support you. But you don't want it so long that when you're skating in close proximity to other athletes and executing those close turns that, you know, the heels in the way and can become that, that the dangerous thing. Um, we have the, the stanchion height is a little higher so that the skaters can get to a deeper edge and remain truly on their blade without slipping onto the boot, which is important when you're crossing under. I mean, you know, that feeling of, Oh, I went a little bit too far and slid onto my boot. So trying to address that. And we had the stanchion swept to accentuate a pointed toe so that it really kind of gives that improved aesthetic when the skaters are skating down the ice with their leg extended. So I feel like it's it's really answered the bell on all fronts for them, and it'll be an evolving conversation. Um, but I think where we're at right now is, is a beautiful blade for these athletes. Well, as Synchro really makes a push to go, you know, to the Olympics, where do you see it developing? Because obviously you mentioned the Haydenettes. Last year they had a very innovative free skate. Uh, that they worked with Adam Blake. They definitely had the death spirals that you were speaking of. You think what are we seeing? More jumping, more lifts. I mean, what kind of things do you expect from Synchro? We're just seeing quality skaters um, mm -hmm. at in, in a place and at a, a level of depth that we haven't seen mm -hmm. in the U.S. It's astounding. I mean, some of the you know the the collegiate and the adult teams have have just come so far. I mean, just the I think the the adults are ready to be an IJS instead of 6.0, just because there's just so much more awareness of what's going on. The the collegiate final was stunning this year, and the mm -hmm. the top three or four teams were just lights out. But you know what's really exciting is the pipeline of talent coming up. When you when you look at the the top two teams, um, top three teams from junior. Mm -hmm. and felt like they could have affected the standings in senior, it, it, it shows you that there's a, a really bright future um, across the country for this discipline. So regardless of what the, the outcome is, Olympics or not, um, I think the, the sport is growing and trending in a, in a direction that you, know, you can say you know, what, what they're doing now won't be anything compared to what they show us in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. Where do you see the sport growing for the Olympics? I mean, what do you expect for next year? We've seen the quads of the men, the quad lots, quad flip this year that I don't think that we expected to see. I think it's developed more quickly, I think, than I definitely would have expected. I think the, the sport's grown in a great direction. And, and for those that are the purists and say mm -hmm. that, um, you know, the, the skating skills are suffering. If you take a look back at some of the step sequences and spins from, you know, four or five Olympics ago where, you know, people just, just, 
flailed their leg up for about a half a revolution and called it a camel spin and, and barely got down into a sit spin and then called it good. Um, I don't think you can look at that comparatively to what we're seeing from today's athletes and say, you know, that the, the IJS has been all bad. I think there's been some tremendous growth in the sport. I think there'll be some exciting changes after the Olympic season. I think there's great opportunity for ISU to, to freshen things up. And I think they intend to do so. Um, but there's no complaints for me heading into this Olympics because, you know, the, the, the quads, the skating, it's, a, mm-hmm. it's all just been magnificent. And I, I, can't, I couldn't be more excited for what's to come. So you've seen a lot of skating this year. Hip hop, is it a yay or a nay for you? Um, it's a yay when it's done well. I think, I think there, are a, there are a few teams out there that are just crushing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there are some teams that it's not suited to their style, but really that can be said about any of the rhythms, right? There are some mm-hmm. teams where they're just more, more comfortable in, in one zone than another. Um, and I think, again, you know, now there's some experience with it. So if it is rotated around to, again, I think we'll see more depth of impressive and unique performances, whereas everyone was kind of feeling their way in the dark this time. So we have to remember, we need to give these athletes a, a minute because they're, they're trying to grow with the times, and this is, that's a good thing. I actually wish that they gave the skaters an opportunity to repeat it next year, to have this as kind of your beta year, to test it out, see which way you want to go with it, and then see next season to really see that I'm not an ISU athlete, but for the Olympic Games, I think it would be interesting to see something that's a little bit more modern, more contemporary for the Olympic year. I think it it definitely, good, bad, or ugly would get people talking uh, during the Olympic Games, and I think that that could be a good thing. Yeah, I mean, if, if that were the case, and I don't disagree with that, but I would have rather than seen it be held back until the mm-hmm. Olympic year, because mm-hmm. I wouldn't really want to see the same rhythm two mm-hmm. years in a row, just because I think that it would look stale, and you know, the skaters would just basically shuffle uh, mp3 files around amongst each other and, and <laughs> skate to each other's music for the following year. But, or at uh, least have brought the hip-hop in earlier and then repeat it for the Olympics. I think we've seen some good programs that would... The Prince program, had we seen that you know, from Tess and Scott at the Olympics, I think that would be very uh, successful. Lyrics. We've had three seasons of this. Are you in favor of lyrics? I'm definitely in favor of it because I think the skaters are, are going about it in a, in a classy and tactful way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think they're, they're easing the judges into it. You know, mm-hmm. I think there's, um, I think that there's a, a, a time and a place for certain kinds of music. And, you know, I, I think everyone was, was hesitant to just go down the, the death metal road right out of the gate. Um, and that's why you saw mm-hmm. so many, Michael Bublé's and mm-hmm. and things of, of that ilk, but um, I I like it. It it allows it allows us to touch on a on genres of music and pieces that I mean, how many times as a skater growing up did you feel, oh my God, I love this song, but the version without the lyrics is just so weak and um, it doesn't carry the same momentum and you know if only if, but now we don't have that because that's all available to us. And I think the more um, you know, the, the more shades of paint that are available to an artist, the better. Well, yeah, I think that I don't notice the lyrics as much. So I think that that's a good thing. Because if you're not noticing the lyrics, it means that it's... Well, that first year was shocking, right? It was shocking a bit because of how it was placed. And, but I think over time, I don't, I don't think about it. I just, it, it is what it is. And I think that the sport needed to do it. So I yep. think that it happened and it was a good change. I think everyone is resistant to change at first at times. But when do you find out about this ISU ambassador role? Are you going to hear about it at the World Championships? I guess. Yeah, the athletes are voting at the World Championships, so they'll right. announce towards the end of the week, I would imagine. All right, well, we'll put our fingers crossed for you. Thanks so much for previewing the World Championships for us, John. Thanks a lot. Yeah. It's always good to be on the yeah. show.